Welcome back to the school. In week 12, we're going to have e-learning for lecture and tutorial. For the lecture, we're going to talk on patients' right part 1. And in the tutorial, that will be in part 2. So after you have completed uh, part 1 and uh, part 2, uh, in part 2, there you will see there will be a QR code where you will have to answer uh, some questions and uh, after you have filled in your student name and your student ID in the QR code and you have attempted the question your attendance will be taken for the whole of week 12 including lecture and tutorial in week 12 uh, we're going to talk about the patients right so these are the a topic that we're going to cover in a short while. The learning objectives for this session will be by the end of the, this uh, session you will have a better understanding what is do not resuscitation order, what are the criteria for resusc do not resuscitation and uh, advanced medical directive is um, options where patients can make a wish not to have life sustaining treatment in the event if they become unconscious and who can certify death and what are the steps in certification uh, of death procedure autopsy is done by a trained doctor who examined uh, the body of a patient who has a suspected death uh, that involved that could involve some criminal charges or is requested by the police and we will look at a famous case that happened a few years back Dr. Tokes uh, who clicked where the police inquest stated that he has some he had committed suicide but the patient's relative do not think likewise. And lastly, uh, we will take a look at the organ transplant ad in Singapore, where this ad is uh, already legalized. And uh, if we do not opt out uh, this hotel ad, uh, we can actually have our organ to be donated out to the recipient. What is a uh, advanced medical directive? It is a legal document that we sign in advance to inform our doctor that we do not want to use any life-sustaining treatment in the event that we become very sick and uh, we are become unconscious. Um, there are a few criteria that uh, this AMD can be made by anyone who is 21 years and above, uh, not mentally unsound. And of course, um, one there must be two witnesses. One of the witness must be a doctor and the other one must be at least 20 years of age. Let's take a look at the AND website to have a better understanding. Now let's take a look at this form. Uh, this is a uh, AND medicate med AND form. If you would like to make this medical directive when you're still conscious and alert, and you must be of course um, of age, uh, twenty one years of age before you make this consent. Now it's stated here that. If you suffer from a terminal illness and you become unconscious and not able to be, make a rational judgment, so then you can use this form. So it's only indicate when you're still conscious and alert. Take a look at the first witness and the second witness. The first witness must be a doctor and the second witness on this form the scientist must be at least 21 years of age. 
our previous uh, ex-Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, he signed an advanced medical directive informing the doctor that he do not want to have any life-sustaining treatment when he becomes terminally ill or unconscious. He says that if I have to be fed by a tube, it is unlikely that I will ever be able to walk and my doctors are to remove the tube and to allow me to make a quick exit. So, this uh, AMD is a legal document that the patient has a right to uh, end his life by not to have any sustaining life sustaining treatment so it's also a form of respecting patients wish in the event that uh, he do not want any um, term any life sustaining treatment if he is unconscious for your information as of uh, as of uh, 2008, 15,000 Singaporeans have already opted for A&D. However, there is still a growing number of Singaporeans who are making this difficult decision because they do not know how and when to sign for this directive. Some people say that this A and B is it considered as a living will? Yes, it can be as a living will because it actually indicates that when they are still conscious and alert, when they are still able to make decision, they have stated a living will that in the event if they become unconscious and they are unable to make decisions, they will not want to have any life support. Advanced medical directive, uh, usually the, gener the general practitioner and most of the healthcare staff, uh, we do not bring this up to our patient um, because one of the things is, is uh, optional and, uh, and also telling the patients to make uh, AMD directive at or a, a form, to sign a form can be very subjective. And uh, one of the GP mentions that uh, Singaporeans are generally quite traditional and conservative. So talking about death and end of life issue is a uh, taboo. So they will not want to discuss this with the patient. Now let's take a look at a case study. This case study. Mr. Lee was diagnosed with stomach cancer last year. He undergo radiotherapy and received palliative care from hospital. His conditions worsened to the point that life support is required and he has, he has to move into a hospital. So from the case study, if the event if in the event that patient condition deteriorated and the uh, relative would like to request for a uh, do not resuscitation, can they make the call? Or rather, if the doctors, after consulting the senior uh, consultant and with the team, they feel that the prognosis is not very good for the patient, can they order a DNR? In fact, a DNR can be also a kind of advanced directive provided that the patients did indicate in the advanced medical directive known as the AMD when the patient is still conscious and alert. So do you know that in the event if, your con if the patient's condition deteriorated, the doctor can actually order for DNR because by tracing the case sheet and if the patient had actually indicated his wish that he do not want 
uh, further resuscitation in the event that his condition deteriorates. Therefore, the doctor can respect the patient's wish by putting an order as do not resuscitate in the event that his condition deteriorated. To help the doctor um, in making decisions on do not resuscitation, many hospitals have started this new initiative known as the Advanced Care Planning, known as ACP. In fact, Tan Tok Seng is one of the very first hospitals that talk to the patients about ACP in the event if they are unconscious and they need to have life sustaining treatment and the doc the patients when they are still conscious they can discuss with their relative and their caregiver if they do want an ACP. Please look at the new initiative uh, in Tan Tok Seng Hospital. It's reported in the street times that uh, in Tan Tok Seng Hospital, the patients are asked to take part in advanced care planning, which empower them to make uh, medical decisions for themselves in the event they are unable to do so. So it's also about honouring their last wishes when they still are able to make the decision. Please read through this uh, story and you'll have a better understanding of why patients wished for advanced care planning and do not want to have resuscitation. <clears throat> Certification of death for the law require all death occurring in Singapore to be registered within 24 hours of occurrence and a death certificate must be issued upon completion of the registration. Um, so you can fill, the, fill in the answer in the box as provided in your textbook. You can fill in the answer in the textbook as well on how to register. An autopsy is a medical procedure uh, which is done by a trained doctor known as the pathologist who will examine the person who, the, the, the patient who has passed away. Uh, he will fully examine we will fully examine the tissues and the fluid and to find out what is the real cause of the death, especially this is a police inquiry. So when will the autopsy be performed? Is it when a medical condition that was not diagnosed? Well, the autopsy will be performed only when there are questions about unexpected death that is not due to natural causes or perhaps the death got to do with some experimental treatment or for example, if the patient suddenly passed away on the operation in an oper operating theater, and which is not supposed to, so an autopsy can be performed to fully examine what is the cause of the death. Is it the complication, or could it be the fault of the surgeon? Within a year of uh, 2009 and 2010, Health Sciences Authority, which is also known as the Forensic Medicine Department, they have conducted 3,560 cases reported to the corona. And out of this, fall from height is the most common cases where they need to exempt the body to see is it really because the patients committed suicide or is it because of attempted suicide or it could be caused by someone that pushed the patients 
from the height. Autopsy findings presented at the coroner's yeah, inquiry into American video. researcher Shane Todd's death show that it was consistent uh, with hanging. A senior consultant forensic pathologist took the stand to explain these findings. About an inquest. Dr. Shane Todd was found hanged from a toilet door in his apartment in June last year. His parents believe he fought for his life and was strangled with a cord or wire. But an autopsy has shown that his death was consistent with hanging. Dr. Wee King Po, who supervised the autopsy, explained the findings. First, the ligature mark around Dr. Todd's neck formed an inverted V shape, which was typical of hanging. If he had been strangled, the mark would have been horizontal and encircled his whole neck. There were also no injuries inside his neck and no external injuries on his body. But another expert consulted by Dr. Todd's family said there appeared to be bruises on Dr. Todd's hands, indicating a fight. In court, the family listened as Dr. Wee explained the discoloration as blood pooling that occurs after death. We just seen some, a lot of pictures of our son, uh, our dead son, and it was a very emotional afternoon. Also on the stand today was psychiatrist Nelson Lee, who diagnosed Dr. Todd with moderate depression as well as anxiety some two months before he died. He noted the researcher hadn't seemed suicidal at the time of the consultation. Dr. Todd said he was stressed about work matters. Dr. Todd's parents have maintained that their son had no reason to take his life. He was looking forward to going back to the U.S. where he had a new job waiting for him. But Dr. Nelson Lee said today that even though a major stress factor is removed, in this case when Dr. Todd quit his job at the IME, it might not be an immediate cure for a depressive disorder. Let's recall the video uh, on the inquest by Dr. Tok family. They, suspic they, are, they suspect that Dr. Tok death is not due to suicide. However, it's a foul play because when they ask a pathologist in the United States to uh, restudy uh, the case, they found that his body showed evidence of struggle and it's not a suicide. When Lucy Heng, age 74, donated one of her kidneys to her husband, Tan Hock Seng, age 72, they became the oldest living donor and recipient spouses in Singapore. He was diagnosed with end-stage kidney failure due to diabetes in 2010 and was advised to undergo a kidney transplant or dialysis. One day when I was in the office after lunch, I felt very tired. But next day, we come to the same thing. After lunch, I feel tired. I need to have a sleep. So I think that there must be something wrong. So I went to the Pony Clinic for a medical checkup. The doctor, he told me that there's something wrong with the kidney. I got a big shot that nearly the day come, I have to go for dialysis. I have seen so many people have dialysis suffering for it. It takes about three to four hours a day. So I refused to have go for dialysis. I met Professor Vasala, then she found out that my kidney was only 20% in function. He said that is very dangerous. If it go below 20, you may cost your life. So that's the only way you can do is only you go for kidney transplant. I said, I'm too old. I'm at the age of 70. She told me that each doesn't count. My wife and my son was there too. So my son immediately proposed, why don't you try mine? So Pro said, you are still young. You get two children 
they are very young. No doubt, transplant there is very minus the risk, but there is still a risk. So immediately, my wife heard that. Why don't you try mine? So, proceed. Why not? I said no. She's too old. I'm old too. So she said each doesn't count. Her kidney is suitable for me. She has two healthy kidney. I'm so lucky. So she arranged a day for us to do the transplant. When problems arose with his kidneys in 2010, Mr. Tan Hock Seng was referred to Professor A. Vath Sala, who heads the Division of Nephrology and the Adult Renal Transplantation Program at the National University Hospital in Singapore. What Mr. Tan would be facing would be years of dialysis. However, in view of his age, he would not do so well as a younger person on dialysis. And moreover, his life expectancy would have been reduced significantly, even though he would have been on dialysis. Mr. Tan Hock Seng was presented with two options, dialysis or a transplant. He did not want to spend his life hooked up to a machine three times a week and was worried by the fact he was already 70. If I don't give him, who is going to give him? Is it the son is too young? I told my son, uh, I give. Mommy gave to your dad, like that mommy will say. I'm not afraid for operation because I myself, my two kids are operation. That means I open three times for my kidney and for my two kids. Yes. Both Mr. Tan and his wife Lucy did very well after the surgery. Uh, firstly, the donor, his wife Lucy, was 72 years old at the time she donated her kidney to her husband and of course her being older meant that she was at greater risk. Um, having said that, we had checked her out very well prior to the surgery and she did extremely well with no post-operative complications and now years later after the donation she continues to do well. So I would say she had an extremely successful surgery. Likewise, Mr. Tan, he also needed a thorough workup for his transplantation surgery. He also did extremely well, and now years later, he's doing very, very well I also. So I would say both surgeries were extremely successful. One of my messages for patients with organ failure is to seek the support of their family members. When there are family members who are willing to donate and they are healthy and they have been screened appropriately, then it is a safe procedure and it benefits both the donor and the recipient and it's the right and the most natural thing to do. Family love is larger than everything. And after the transplant, both of us get well, we can do anything we like. I can send my grandchildren, to school and bring them home from school. This one thing I feel proud of is a kidney transplant, is an organ transplant department in the NUH. I would like to thank them. Despite his wife's age, Mr. Tan decided to go ahead and the operation was carried out on April 18th, 2011. Organ transplant ad is uh, an ad that prohibits uh, buying or selling of organ in Singapore. Uh, you can fill in a blank that is in your textbook. The organ transplant ad continue to say that uh, any persons who receive the sale or the supply uh, of an organ from person or from his own body or they enter into a contract with a company uh, they shall be guilty of the offences and are not exceeding 100,000 
or to imprisonment for a short for a term not more than ten years, or can be either both. Some 2,460 organ transplants from deceased donors were successfully carried out since the Human Organ Transplant Act, or HOTA, was introduced in 1987. Now, speaking in Parliament, Health Minister Corbyn Wan said most of the transplants involve kidneys and corneas. He revealed that less than 3% of the population, or about 77,000 people, have opted out. As for living donor organ transplants, Mr Kaur said the Transplant Ethics Committees received 156 applications last year. 14 were rejected. The applicants have to satisfy the uh, Ethics Committee that the donations, the donors are <coughs> fully informed of what they are going into and, uh, and that there is no coercion or, of any kind. So usually if, if the committee is suspicious about some of the motives behind the applicants' applications, then uh, they will reject the applicants. Okay, now let's take a look at the organ transplant ad. Uh, you can go into the, uh, this uh, website to have a better look on the organ transplant ad. I would like you to read specifically uh, page 11 to 13, which will help you to answer the question in the next slide. So here are the answer about the uh, ethics committee for HOTA. In this case study, uh, you we see a patient uh, who has a kidney failure in the 1995. He was born on dialysis. And moreover, he also has an 84 years old mother to take care of. And when she, when he received the transplant, uh, a new kidney, he gained a second life. And he mentioned that with this new gain of life that he has from the donor with a new kidney, he's a taxi driver, and uh, financially he's now more independent. And also, with his new second birth of life by the donor, uh, when now he has a new uh, new kidney, he bring the mothers out more often for for meals and dinner, and sometimes also take her for overseas. And he continued to say that he also go back to the dialysis center to give support to other patients, and he is one of the patients that have very fortunate patients that have uh, a kidney transplant done. Well, in this article, uh, you will see uh, uh, an, an article about the gene editing, which give hopes for humans and they are trying to experiment uh, in planting uh, cells onto the onto pig and uh, if it's successful, uh, the pig uh, organs, part of the organs like for example the skin or the ear or the nose can be transplanted to humans. But will that really help in solving, in resolving the lack of humans organ? Well, there is there is uh, ethical issues that we may face. Imagine that we are receiving uh, tissues that's not from a human but from an animal. So what kind of ethical issue would that be? Would that really help in the issue of resolving the deficiency or the lack of transplant? This uh, medical therapy education research ad is an optional scheme where people can donate their organs like the kidney, liver, heart, the skin, etc. for the purpose of transplantation and more into education and research after they pass on. 
So who can pledge to donate his or her organ for the research and education's purpose? Uh, they need to sign uh, a form to say that in the event if they pass on, uh, they can donate that for research purpose. They must be 18 years and above and they must not suffer from any mental illness. So only the person who made the pledge can revoke it. And also in cases where the patient had not pledged the organs under this act before passing away, the family member can also be able to donate his organ under uh, for medical research purpose after his death if they wish to do so. You can find a little bit more information in this website. Okay, now there's another video which is a very interesting video that you can watch on the FSB Organ Transplant.
this are the facts about uh, hotel. So please fill in the blend as well.